I put in a lot of hours to be sure things were in order before my two-week vacation. I sat back in my desk chair and turned to admire the scenery through the window behind my desk when I heard the unmistakable sweet voice of my assistant. Well, Luke, are you ready for the big day? As ready as I'll ever be, Melanie. It's not like I haven't done this before. Make this one stick, would ya, boss? You don't need to set a record for the most times married in a decade. I smiled. You pickin' on me? Maybe a little. But you're too good a guy to deal with all this sh, damn, sorry, crap you've gone through. Call it what it is, Mel. It's been a ton of bull. Are you ready to take off? Is there anything you need me to cover? No, I think we've gone over everything. Thanks for suggesting I take off after Wednesday for a Saturday wedding. Tonight I can just stop at the pub and relax before being buried in details this Thursday and Friday. I'm glad we're keeping this wedding small. So, will you report me to HR if your assistant gives you a big hug? I never have before. Melanie had become one of my closest friends and has been very special to me since the day I hired her shortly after I accepted the position at Personal Wealth Financial nearly 10 years ago. I'll never forget when I interviewed her for her job. Her resume made her the top contender, but when she came into my office I observed a somewhat homely, skinny girl who seemed shy and reserved. It didn't take long for me to notice the redness around her nose and slightly dark eyes. The poor girl was sick as a dog but still fought through to make her interview. I was impressed enough to have her come back for a second interview. It was then that I met a real dynamo with personality overflowing. True, she was not outwardly attractive. She was skinny as a rail and didn't seem to have enough of a butt to hold her slacks up. Yet I learned she was full of confidence and personality, and she exuded a beauty some of the prettiest girls I knew could learn from. Her husband was a lucky man. I decided to kick back for a few hours at my favorite pub near my home in Kirkland, Washington, and grab a light dinner. Kaylee, the bartender, has filled many roles for me over the years. Her lovely red hair framed the rugged face of the woman who was my second mom, confidant, sounding board, and caring friend. When she was young, I'm sure she was fairly attractive, but hard living and smoking had taken its toll on her late 40s features. But she was a beautiful person to me. She had seen me at my worst and always seemed to have the right words when I needed them. The pub was sparsely filled and had the familiar smell of fried food and the atmosphere of raw emotions being soothed. As I sauntered up to the bar, Kaylee looked toward me and smiled. Mr. Three cheats to the wind. How's my favorite customer? Better than I deserve, Kaylee. Are you still chained to that man of yours or are you ready to run off with me? What, and ruin the big day this Saturday for your lovely bride? So, the usual, Luke? Yep. As Kaylee scurried off to the tap, I noticed an attractive woman seated alone three stools down from me. I guessed that she was approaching something north of 35. She was biting her lower lip and sporting a slight grin that seemed to result from my banter with Kaylee. I decided to be neighborly and greet her. Hi. Her forehead creased and suspicious eyes glared as she took stock of me. You don't look drunk. I raised an eyebrow. That's the most interesting greeting anyone has ever thrown my way. No, I'm not drunk. The bartender said you were three sheets to the wind. I assumed that meant she thought you were drunk. Oh, I chuckled. That's her nickname for me, but it's not three sheets. It's three cheats. Great. Another guy who can't keep it in his pants. She seemed to bite down on her lip a little harder and the scowl on her face told me this was personal to her. Just as I was about to speak, Kaylee placed my beer in front of me and came to my rescue. Lady, Luke here is one of the nicest and most faithful men I've ever met. He wasn't the cheater. Sadness clouded her face and her lips quivered. Sorry. I was pretty sure tears were close to making their appearance so I nervously stuck out my hand to greet her hoping to avoid the emotional flow that seemed imminent. No problem. I'm Luke. She gave my hand a quick frantic handshake as if she were afraid of human contact. No, I am sorry. I guess you can call me been cheated on too many times to count, or Linda for short. Glad to meet you, Linda for short. Sorry. Sore subject? 
Her mood lightened considerably with my stupid joke. I hate making a woman cry and the change in her disposition was a welcome development. Yeah, definitely a sore subject. But something tells me your three-cheat experience has quite a story behind it. I guess, but I'm not sure you want to hear about it. Go on, Luke. Tell her your story, Kaylee interjected. It's fascinating. Linda pretend pouted at me. Please? You two aren't going to give me a choice, are you? Nope, they replied in unison. Okay, okay. Let's see, where should I start? Harper. Life doesn't always turn out the way we expect. I knew my marriage was over well before our first anniversary. Funny thing is, I wasn't all that upset by the end of the marriage, but my confidence had taken a beating. I first dated Harper during our senior year of high school. I was an 18-year-old virgin, and she was also 18 and far from pure. I didn't really seek her out, but we were thrust together by a group of friends. I should have declined, but my little head beat my big head for that decision. My teammates cornered me in the locker room after a game. Luke, when are you gonna quit Hanjin with the blimp and get a girl worthy of our quarterback? Chuck, you talk about Aubrey like that again and I'll lay you out. She's not a blimp, just a little cushy. But I like her and, even though we're not dating, she's my best friend. Fine, but you need a real girl that puts out. We gotta get that cherry of yours busted. I don't need your help getting laid. Back off. Ted stepped in to calm me down. Hey, Luke, sorry. It's just, well, Harper was telling my girlfriend that she'd really like to get with you. Harper may be gorgeous, but she likes getting with anyone who wears pants. That's not what I'm after. She's not really like that. She's nice and she has a thing for you. Come to my party tomorrow night. She'll be there. Just see if there's some chemistry. What can it hurt? The guys were really cruel when it came to my friend, Aubrey. She wasn't the sleek, bone-thin model type, but she was exactly what I liked. She had a girl-next-door wholesome face that I knew would stay gorgeous even into middle age and beyond. We didn't really date, but you couldn't tell the difference because we were always together. Truth is, I found her exceptionally beautiful both outside and inside. If I had my way, I'd want us to be each other's first lover, but she had a moral core I admired and I tried to emulate it. We grew up in the church together and I wanted to be faithful to my beliefs. Unfortunately those damn hormones of a teenage boy were crumbling the weak defenses I'd built around my chastity. Face it. I wanted to get laid. At Ted's party, Harper sought me out like a heat-seeking missile latching onto its target. Luke. Ted said you'd be here. Hey, Harper. You're looking good. Good enough to eat? Uh, well, I don't. Relax, Luke. I'm just messing with ya. She wasn't messing with me. We were playing tonsil hockey within the hour, and before the night was half over my sexual expertise had changed on many levels. I was firmly in a state of lust. Aubrey knew right away. She seemed hurt but resigned herself to my decent into the dark side. Several weeks later she started dating Dennis, the center from our team. Knowing Aubrey would take things slow, I teased them both that, as quarterback, I had my hands in Dennis' crotch more than Aubrey. She was not amused, and Dennis told me to cool it. I apologized to them both and felt rather sheepish afterwards. The way they called me out made me ashamed of my changing attitudes, but, after all, I was a dumb teenage boy. I started to drift from Aubrey and Dennis. In hindsight, I was living in a darkness that made the light surrounding them uncomfortable for me. I wanted to have fun, and being near them was dampening my enjoyment. Harper and I dated and explored one another for the remainder of the school year and the following summer. I loved our sexual relationship. She was hot and knew how to use her well-developed talents. She was also easy to talk with and we found we had a lot of common interests and views. After several months of sexual bliss, I started falling for her. In the fall, Harper planned to attend Washington State while I was on my way to Indiana to study at Purdue on a football scholarship. As much as I was growing to love her, I knew long distance would be tough for us both. 
We agreed not to be exclusive and to get together whenever we were both home. My hormones and party instincts ruled my life for the first two years of college. True to our word, Harper and I hooked up when we were home. We never discussed what happened when we were apart, and that seemed to be wise on both our part. I found I was measuring every girl I got with against Harper, and none of them made the grade. I was missing her more and more and couldn't wait until I saw her again. I started calling her more frequently and I sensed she was feeling the same way I did. My love for her was growing even though we were separated by thousands of miles. Some level of maturity and responsibility kicked in around my junior year. The values I was taught as a kid were flooding my conscience, and I was tired of the emptiness that seemed to be a part of my promiscuous lifestyle. From that point on I was only intimate with Harper and I started thinking of how to propose. The summer prior to our senior year, I needed to see where Harper's head was regarding our relationship. Baby, can we talk about something? Sure, Luke. Are you okay? You're looking kinda serious. Well, I am. I've been thinking a lot and, I guess the first two years of college I was, well, a bit wild with the girls. I always loved you and knew we'd be together again, but I was horny and girls were so, sorta, available. Were you the same with guys? I I hooked up a few times for fun, but I always wished it was with you. I mean, no one else could compare, you know? Yeah, I know. I figured you were getting with guys, and that's okay. It's what we agreed on. But this year for me was different. It started to feel like I was cheating and I realized I wanted to be a one-woman man with you. I wanted you to know that I haven't as much as kissed a girl since we were together last summer. I'm hoping, maybe, that you could promise me you feel the same way. I only love you, Luke. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Would. I mean, will you marry me? Harper jumped into my lap and bounced up and down, shouting, yes, yes, yes. We made love, and then laid next to each other and started sharing our dreams for our life together. Suddenly, she sat up with a concerned look on her face. You don't want to get married now before our senior year, do you? No. Maybe a few months after we graduate. Harper seemed relieved by that. I assumed she was thinking of what would be practical, but it still bothered me a little. I also realized I never really did get an answer regarding her more recent faithfulness, yet she waved some magic wand that made me believe she was true only to me. It was a minor thorn in my mind at that point, but it came back to haunt me. After graduation, Harper got a job with a real estate firm while I started my career at Personal Wealth Financial Planning. We were married in December that same year, and I thought I was happy. I was determined to go back to the faith I had growing up, but it became obvious that Harper had no interest in spiritual matters. I was starting to realize that living with someone gives you a whole lot more insight into what they are really like. I didn't need to wait too long after the wedding for the first warning sign. Harper talked me into cutting short our honeymoon in California wine country so we could attend a New Year's Eve party with a lot of her friends, most of whom she knew from college. I hardly saw my new bride all night. The party was at a dance hall all of us had chipped in to rent. Harper flitted around the room gabbing with everyone. On occasion, I had no idea where she was. Several of her girlfriends kept me busy, almost like it was their assignment for the night. I had to carry a passed out Harper to the car and into our apartment. She was very attentive and apologetic for her behavior at the party, so I let it slide. But over the following year, things built up in my mind that I couldn't come to grips with. She had lots of evening appointments, she was less than forthcoming on the details of her work and her life, and I felt at times like her friends took top position in her list of priorities. How could I be married for less than a year, and yet still feel so alone? A year passed, and it was time for another New Year's Eve bash at the same venue. I really didn't want to go, but I also felt obligated to see what Harper did when she was alone with her friends. I figured I had a better chance of seeing the real Harper if she didn't think I was there, so I begged off at the last minute claiming an upset stomach. Harper almost seemed relieved that I was staying home. I let the party go on for a few hours, and then showed up at about 10. I tried to stay out of sight once I arrived. It didn't take me long to see Harper across the room. 
She had a group of six guys standing around her and all were taking turns giving her heavy, passionate kisses. Then I saw her drag one of them by the hand into a hallway that went to small practice rooms for the dance classes. The others were hanging back, giving each other high fives, and looking very much like they were standing in a waiting line. I stood there a little while wondering what to do, and determined I had to see what was going to happen. I marched across the room, but I didn't escape the notice of Harper's friend, Amy. Luke. Harper said you were homesick. Out of my way, Amy. Luke, please, don't go back there. I grabbed her by the arms and looked her square in the eyes. Why? What will I see? Amy started to tremble in fear. She could see the anger building in me and I did little to hide it. Luke, you won't like it. Please, don't. She really does love you. I pushed her aside and went after my wife. There, in the practice room, was my wife making out and starting to get undressed with the guy she dragged willingly to the room. I wanted to barge in and go all Chuck Norris on them. Instead, without being noticed I snapped a few pictures on my phone and left to go home. Once in the apartment, I printed one of the pictures and left it on the table with my wedding ring. I packed enough clothing for a week and went to the Holiday Inn. It was weird. I sat in the room feeling like I was supposed to cry or to lash out in anger. Instead, it felt more like I finally had answers to all those questions that had been building in my mind. I kept her in the dark for a few days while I took the time to find a small furnished apartment, then called to arrange to come over so we could talk. Luke. Where the hell are you? How could you just leave like that? I'll be over tonight to talk. Luke, please. I'm sorry for what you saw. It was. Shut up, Harper. We'll talk tonight. I'll be there at 7. I hung up and searched for some kind of emotion to grasp. Emptiness certainly rushed in. A bit of anger and a healthy dose of ego damage was flooding in too, but I had an overwhelming sense of relief. Sure, I wasted a little over a year on her. Somehow my discovery of the real Harper was justifying what my growing suspicions were telling me, our relationship was never really right. My mind went back to a conversation my dad and I had years ago. We were talking about love and relationships and I asked how I'd recognize when I'd found the right woman. His words now rang in my ears. It's different with everyone, but when you kiss her, maybe your knees will go weak, or perhaps you'll feel a glow as if you were filled with electricity. Maybe it manifests itself in some other way, it doesn't matter. You'll know. I couldn't remember feeling that type of confirmation with Haley. Sure, our kisses were filled with heat, but I now recognized that was purely physical. I never sensed the real connection my dad talked about. So, to my surprise, I was, okay. I was still disappointed at her behavior, but I was coping just fine. I walked into the apartment at 7 without knocking. Harper sat at the kitchen table staring down at the damning picture in my ring. Calmly and clearly resigned to the inevitable, she greeted me with the words that summed it all up. We're through, aren't we? I sat across from her. Yes. Aren't you gonna scream or rant or something? Why? Should I? I would. It seems I've finally seen the real you, Harper. And, truth be told, we're not right for each other. Even more revealing, at least to me, is that I don't think I ever really loved you the way people in a marriage should love each other. I don't think you love me that way either. Let's part, keep things civil, and move on. Okay? I was surprised she wasn't more emotional. She just shrugged her shoulders which clearly told me what she was thinking even more convincingly than her next words. I guess I wasn't really ready to be married. I wanted to be ready. You're the kind of guy I want to settle down with and I wanted to be the girl and wife that you wanted. I really did. You're right. It's just not me. Today back at the bar. Linda seemed deep in thought as I finished the Harper portion of my story. Wow. I guess you dodged a bullet when you realized the truth so early in your marriage. I didn't figure out my marriage was a lie until our 14th year. Don't take this wrong because you're really a beautiful woman, but I can see the pain in your face when you talk about it. 
I guess no matter how long it takes, learning the truth can hurt like hell, but at least you can move forward, maybe a little wiser. With my elbow on the bar, I rested my head against my hand and looked into her eyes. Something tells me I think I need to hear your story too. I'm getting better, but, yeah, I'll share my tale sometime. But we're only one cheat into your story and I gotta hear it all. If you have to. It ends better than it started, so maybe that will offer you some encouragement. Linda looked away for a moment and appeared deep in thought. Do you still see Harper? On occasion. She was diagnosed with MS not long after our divorce. It made her grow up fast. She's holding up well and ended up marrying a nice guy. They seem to be good for each other. You aren't one of those guys who loves it when karma bites his ex in the ass, are you? No, and certainly not like that. Getting sick or something like MS is not anything I'd wish on anyone. And I still have some good feelings for Harper. We really did end on good terms. So who is number two? I had to chuckle. Number two. Fitting description for how things went with Zoe. Zoe. I met Zoe at a party thrown for my old friends, Aubrey and Dennis. They had been married while still in college, and upon graduation Dennis took a position with a large manufacturing firm. At a very young age he was being promoted to VP of Finance and had to move to Dallas. All O. F their friends gathered at the Hyatt Ballroom to wish them well on their move. I was talking with a friend when the room seemed to light up as Zoe waltzed in with an air of glamour and grace. She was, in a word, stunning. I later learned her photo had been on the cover of Maxim about a year earlier. Every man, myself included, had to wipe the drool from their lips. Most of the men there were married and their wives were with them. Then the funniest thing happened. The wisest general in the army couldn't have organized a quicker or more effective defense than the maneuver the wives instantly launched. Almost every man was physically pulled into a serious conversation with their spouse. I was one of three single men remaining, and Zoe quickly cast her hungry gaze in my direction. I watched her purposely mosey my way and I was instantly afraid that the stirring in my loins would soon be obvious. Hi. I'm Zoe. Am I imagining things, or did about 20 women just demonstrate their claim on their men? I don't think it was your imagination. I'm Luke, by the way. She shook my hand and her touch made shivers run up and down my spine. Zoe. Nice to meet you, Luke. I guess the ladies must think I'm a threat. You don't seem to have a ball and chain protecting you. No, my chain was broken a few months ago. And, yes, you're a threat. You gotta know how gorgeous you are. Thanks, but you're damn gorgeous yourself. I could feel the warmth in my cheeks from a strong blush attack as I scrambled for a suitable comeback. Well, shall we spend some time admiring each other's gorgeousness? Oh, damn, her laugh was amazing. I like you, Luke. You're funny. So maybe we should just hang and get to know each other. And hang, we did. She was bright and engaging. We talked with great ease and I was hooked. She seemed into me as well. The party was breaking up in Zoe and I set a date for the next evening. She had to leave a little early, which gave me time to pay attention to Aubrey and Dennis. Aubrey was still the wholesomely beautiful girl I knew in high school. She still wasn't thin, but to me she was still perfect. As I walked over, she greeted me with a bit of a scowl. Hey, Casanova. Did Zoe get her hooks in you? We sorta hit it off. Why? Be careful. You know Dennis and I care a lot about you, and we don't want to see you hurt again. She seems harmless, and I really like her. Luke, I love you, my friend. Open your eyes. You're repeating a pattern here. I was a little upset with Aubrey's chastisement. How could she assume I didn't know what I was doing? I'll be fine. I mean, we just met. I'm not walking down the aisle yet. Okay. I mean, she's smart and successful so she has a lot going for her. Just promise to keep your eyes open. Please, guard your heart. It's a good heart and you're a great guy. You need to find a woman who is worthy of you. I wanted to say it, but
but I couldn't. I wanted to say, I found that woman, but I let you go. Zoe and I didn't waste any time. We seemed to be in sync on all the major issues of life. It wasn't long before we were intimate, and six months after we met we were married. I made my feelings clear that faithfulness was high on my list of priorities, and she gave me every indication she felt the same way. She seemed to share the same commitment I had to faith, so I assumed we had what it took to last a lifetime. She owned a small modeling agency and she focused on being sure to have a good work-life balance. We were married without much pomp and circumstance, and started our life together with a lot of hope for the future. Our home life was warm and rewarding, and our sex life was off the charts fantastic. Zoe never gave me cause to question her commitment to monogamy or to our marriage. After three years of marital bliss, we started discussing having children. She seemed excited by the prospect, but I noticed she never really took the steps needed to get pregnant such as going off the pill even though she had agreed she would. Even so, I was walking on air and felt secure that I struck gold having Zoe in my life. It seems just when you think everything is right with the world and your life is on the right track, life decides to throw you for a loop. It was a dark and rainy Monday when I faced one of the most horrible days of my life. Aubrey called my office early that morning. She rarely called me at work, and I could tell from her voice that something was wrong. Aubrey, what's going on? I don't want you to worry, but I, um, wanted you to know. Dennis, Dennis has leukemia. Oh, my God. You just found out? Just got home from the doctor's office. He said there's lots they can do for it these days. I hope he's right. Are you okay? She sighed and I could hear her compose herself. Yeah. I mean, the doctor seemed upbeat. It's an unexpected shock, for sure. He's been a little tired lately, but we didn't think this. But you know Dennis. He's pretending to be upbeat, but I can see through his act. Keep us in your thoughts, will ya? She tried to sound encouraged, but I knew my friend too well. She was covering up intense fear and a strong wave of depression. I wanted to be there to hug both of my friends, but that couldn't happen. We usually talked by phone about once a month and I resolved from that point forward to step that up to weekly at a minimum. She was thousands of miles away, but my friend needed me. Our call disconnected and I was overwhelmed with depression. I felt like I was drowning in an ocean of worry as I stared out my office window at the gloomy, rainy landscape. I was dealing with that news when another good friend, my personal assistant Melanie, walked softly into my office and closed the door. Her face was flushed and eyes red as if she'd been crying, and I assumed by her appearance that she heard about Dennis and Aubrey. I was wrong. Luke, you know I love you and would never want to hurt you, right? Mel, you're scaring me. What's up? I fretted all weekend about this, but you need to know. My husband and I had dinner and went dancing to celebrate our anniversary on Saturday. We went to the jazz club downtown, and… She started crying. My mind raced trying to guess what she was going to tell me. Then it hit me. Zoe was supposed to be in a partner's meeting Saturday in Portland and she stayed the night. What, Mel? Your wife was there with some guy, and they, well… I took some pics. Oh, God, I'm sorry, Luke. The pics were pretty clear. Fondling under the table, grinding on the dance floor, and heavy kissing were clearly captured. My tears flowed like the Snoqualmie Falls. First Dennis and Aubrey's horrible news tore at my emotions, and now Zoe was betraying me. Melanie smothered me with hugs and apologies. I managed to calm down and thank her for telling me, and I apologized for Zoe ruining their weekend. Mel forwarded the pics to me, and I printed the more graphic ones for use that evening. I recognized the guy as one of the models Zoe managed. I stopped at the pub on the way home to drink some courage for the confrontation. Kaylee was great at helping me calm down. A couple of my friends from football days were there as well. I didn't know it at the time, but two of them launched a plan to teach Zoe's lover a lesson. I later learned they had tracked him down and beat the hell out of the guy. I kinda wish they hadn't, and yet I felt lots of guilt about secretly feeling glad they had. Waiting for Zoe to get home seemed to drag on for eternity. My stomach churned. 
My mind kept shifting gears between anger, hate, regret, thoughts of forgiveness, and pain. When she finally waltzed in, I was seated at the dining room table with my exhibits ready to present. She entered the room all cheery and sweet. Hi, babe. She came over to give me a kiss and I pushed her away. Sit down. Now. She sat so quickly she almost missed the chair. Luke, why are you talking to me like that? I don't know. One by one I placed the photos on the table. Is there some other way I should talk to you? She glanced at the first and immediately turned white. Her tears fell freely and would have melted me a day earlier. Now they just pissed me off. So what part of faithful didn't you understand? Luke, I. What? What are you gonna say? It's just sex? It means nothing? You only love me? What can you possibly say that is gonna get you unscrewed? Please, don't hate me. Take a few days and cool off. I'll never. Never what? Never do it again? How often have you done it with this guy? How about other guys? I can't believe you'd betray me like this, especially knowing how Haley cheated on me. You just don't understand a woman like me. Understand? My rage was boiling. From the back of her neck I pulled her face within inches of mine and yelled at the top of my lungs. I completely understand what you are. I'd call you a pig, but that's an insult to swine. You had me fooled, didn't you? I'm sure you and your boy loved talking about me while he was stealing you from me. I roughly pushed her away because I was afraid of what I might do. I could see the fear in her eyes and it both pleased me and scared me. I couldn't look at her face anymore so I turned my back to her so I could gather the strength to speak more calmly. I guess I'll never understand a liar or a cheater. You really had me fooled. You've betrayed me and everything I thought we had. Damn. I didn't think I could be hurt this badly, but congratulations, you've managed to destroy me. I think I understand exactly what you are, and I definitely know I can never trust you again. I paced for a few moments trying to calm my anger while she softly cried. I want you out of this house tonight. My lawyer is drafting the divorce paperwork now. The prenup is in effect since you managed to screw yourself on that. You have a half hour to get out and we'll talk by text about you getting the rest of your stuff. F. I started to storm off and she was deep in the throes of wailing. I didn't care. Luke, please. I love only you. Please, don't. I paused with Zoe to my back as I looked down at the floor. Love? Well I don't love you anymore. I look at you and all I see is ugliness and absolutely nothing I want. And don't you dare say you love me. Love doesn't do what you did to me. You only love yourself. Now get out of here before I return. And tell your boyfriend to run. Fast and far. Back to the bar. Linda was tentative when she offered an observation. Your reaction seems stronger than I would have imagined. Even though we just met, I get the impression that you're a more kind and gentle type of guy. Luke is both kind and gentle, Kaylee added. But betrayal can unleash the beast in us all. Yeah. I admit I was probably a bit out of my head. But, Linda, you've obviously been on the receiving end of a cheater so maybe you can understand. With Harper, I knew we were never right for each other. I thought with all my heart that Zoe was the one and she ripped my heart out. I said those things to vent and probably to hurt her as much as I could without getting physical. But what I said was true. Maybe she'll learn from it, maybe not. How did it go after that? Did you ever get some closure or manage to part amicably? I calmed down and we eventually talked. If she had just made a mistake, I think I would have tried to save our marriage. I mean, I'm not perfect so I would have hoped for forgiveness if the tables were turned. But this was an affair that had been going since before Zoe and I were married, and she couldn't even commit to ending it. So we parted, but not on the friendliest of terms. Surprisingly, Zoe was compliant and resigned herself to the divorce as presented to her. She moved her business to New York and I haven't seen or heard from her since. What happened to her lover? 
You said he was badly beaten. Did that come back on you? He had lots of bruises and was hurting for a while, but he recovered. The thing that upset him the most was a scar over his eye that threatened his modeling career, but even that is cleared up. Strangely enough, Zoe was my alibi since the attack occurred 45 miles away at the same time I was confronting Zoe in our dining room. I admit my first reaction was a sense that justice had been served, but that faded quickly. Sure, he was a piece of scum, but I didn't want that to happen and I never instigated it. So, that's two. It seems you picked the same kind of women and you expected different results. I smiled sadly. You sound like my friends. They've all tried to tell me the same thing, but I guess I'm a slow learner since I went down a similar path after Zoe. You're kidding? No. I wish I was. As sad as it was, I think you'll get a kick out of how I learned about Samantha's cheating. Samantha. My divorce was finalized in October of 2016. I decided to fly down to Dallas to see Aubrey and Dennis to join them for Thanksgiving. As usual, air travel was heavy that week and I found myself sitting at SeaTac for several hours through delays. I was concentrating on my beer in the lounge when a lovely blonde woman plopped into the seat across from me while she was holding a tense conversation with someone on her phone. Look. I can't control what the hell the airlines do. I can't go to the gate and demand we take off because you demand that I arrive on time. It's delayed. I'll be there later than expected. She had the cutest dimples that danced when she talked and I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. She disconnected the call without waiting for a response from the other end and harumphed a few choice words under her breath. Then, looking at me she realized I couldn't help but hear her conversation and assumed I was laughing at her. Are you laughing at me, jerk? Oh, gosh, no. I'm sorry it seemed that way. I didn't mean to hear you. Then what are you laughing at? I was caught and decided honesty was best. I hope it doesn't piss you off, but, well, I noticed you have those amazing, beautiful dimples that really dance on your face when you argue with someone. Thankfully, she laughed and blushed while trying to hide her dimples. Sorry. My mother can make me irritable when she gets like that. She thinks the world revolves around her schedule and it's my fault that I'm gonna arrive late. Mothers can be that way. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. I love my mom. But it's frustrating enough dealing with air travel, and I didn't need her attitude right now. Uh, your phone is ringing. It's her. Trust me, I'm sparing her feelings by not answering. I'm not in a good mood and I can't be held responsible for what might come out of my mouth. Can I buy you a drink to help with your attitude adjustment? A drink from a stranger? She flashed a little girl look with a shy grin and her dimples on full display. I'm not that kind of girl. Well, I'm Luke. And you are. She chuckled, smiled, and with pretend exasperation blurted out, I'm Samantha, or Sam to my friends. See? Now we're not strangers. What would you like to drink, Sam? We chatted for almost two hours before my flight finally boarded. I was captivated by her wit and charm. She didn't quite have the cover girl beauty of Harper or Zoe, but she was still extremely attractive. Her smile was a little crooked, kinda like Drew Barrymore, and combined with those wonderful dimples I found her sexy as hell. She had the body of an athlete, which made me feel like a high school sports star that let himself go a bit too much. I decided I had to fix that. I was almost sorry to hear the announcement from the airline. Dang. Sam, they're starting to board my flight. I really enjoyed getting to know you. Are you based here in the Seattle area? Yeah. I live in Redmond. I'm almost next door in Kirkland. Can I be so bold as to ask if you are in a relationship? Because I'd love to buy you dinner and get to know you. My opinion of how cute she was boosted even higher when she wrinkled her nose. Wow, you move fast. But you're kinda nice, so, okay. Give me your phone. Sure. Here. Okay. My info is in your contacts under Sam and you are free to call me anytime after I get back next Wednesday. Thanks. I must say that I never thought I'd be so happy after having to sit and wait for a flight. 
We hugged and I felt like I was in heaven. She pulled back from our embrace and she looked into my eyes. Do you really like my dimples, or was that just a line? Trust me. I really, really like them. Luke? Yeah. Please don't turn out to be some kind of weirdo. I don't want to have to knock you around. I was glad she was laughing. Don't worry. I'm so normal that I'm more afraid of boring you than anything else. The flight was great because I felt like I didn't even need the jet. I was in full lust mode with the hope of love on the horizon. The chemistry seemed more than right. In Dallas, Dennis picked me up at the airport and I was surprised how good he looked. On the drive to their home he told me the good news that he was in remission. He is one of the really good guys on this earth, and I couldn't have been more happy or relieved to hear he was doing well. Dennis and Aubrey had three children and their home felt like the place I've always wanted for myself. Love was everywhere. Aubrey cooked a fantastic feast and took the time to scold me about picking self-absorbed women to marry instead of finding a girl with good character. In the back of my mind, I wondered what category Sam would fit into should we end up in a relationship. I waited to call Sam until Thursday of the week we were both back home. I expected a quick conversation to plan a date, but it ended up making me feel like a teenager when our call turned into a two-and-a-half-hour marathon. My head was floating in the clouds by the time our call ended. I could feel the huge smile on my face and I savored the moment. I knew then that I wanted her. I couldn't wait to go pick her up for our date. I was so anxious that I had to fight the urge to leave way too early. Her apartment was only three miles from my house, and I expected to spend a lot of time in the coming months driving the route between our homes. Our first date was at one of my favorite places, Matt's Rotisserie and Oyster House. We talked with ease and I couldn't stop gazing into her eyes. I was falling much faster than I wanted to, but I was clearly falling. The longer we talked, the more beautiful she seemed. Our conversation turned to light kissing during dessert. We barely made it out the door when she pulled me into one, deliciously wet, tonsil hockey kiss. Luke, you have no idea how much I want you to come to my place for a while. Oh, I think I know just how much, but I want to take it a little slow. Is that okay? Yeah, I guess. You're still getting over your marriage, so, there's no rush. Thanks for understanding. You're a lot more understanding than my little brain. She raised an eyebrow as she smiled at me. I was going to say something like, that thing poking my stomach doesn't feel little at all, but that wouldn't be something to say if we're taking it slow, would it? I chuckled to hide how nervous I suddenly felt. No, saying something like that would definitely change my timeline. Luke, I've been craving you since the moment you told me your name in the airport, but let's let things develop at a relaxed pace. I'm good with that. Cold showers worked for a few weeks, but by Christmas we knew we were in love and we let our passions loose. Now I've never run a marathon, but intimacy with Sam was the most strenuous workout I've had since football drills at Purdue. Thankfully her favorite position was riding cowgirl so I had some time to catch my breath. I wanted to be sure I could keep up with her, so getting into better shape became my top New Year's resolution. Several months law. Ter, Sam moved into my home just in time for Valentine's Day. There was no question that we were exclusive and on the fast track to commitment. We planned on a small and intimate wedding that summer. Sam had played competitive volleyball and stayed very active with various sporting activities. Hiking, kayaking, biking, and jogging consumed our weekends when we weren't busy with bedroom Olympics. She was active in a local gym and I decided to join too. We were making a contest of working out, so I bought us both Fitbits and an iPad app that allowed us to monitor our fitness progress both individually and as a couple. I was getting into the best shape of my life. The wedding was set for the first Saturday in August. We each invited our immediate families and a few friends. Melanie, my personal assistant, was coming with her husband. Aubrey and Dennis were flying in to attend. I felt I had it right this time and I couldn't wait for Sam to become Mrs. Riley. The wedding was informal with only 37 invited guests, so Sam never had the stress that turned many women into bridezillas. Sam's sister was maid of honor and she didn't bother with other attendants. 
We had our minister perform the ceremony right at the reception hall thus avoiding transportation issues or wasted time. I stood with the minister as I watched for my bride to walk towards me. Before the procession I scanned the guests. Melanie was several rows back and beaming at me, but I didn't see Aubrey or Dennis. I hoped they didn't have flight problems. We said I do, kissed, and started the party. The longer the reception went on, the more concerned I was that I didn't see Aubrey or Dennis. About two hours into the reception I felt my phone buzz with an incoming text. Aubrey, Luke, I'm sorry we missed your special day. I didn't want you to worry or spoil your celebration, but Dennis' cancer came back. He went to the hospital yesterday. Don't worry. We're fine, but I hate that I wasn't there for you. Call me when you get back from your honeymoon. I told Sam and she agreed I needed to call Aubrey immediately. I did and she tried to convince me things would be okay, but we knew each other too well. Dennis was in trouble, and she was not doing a good job of hiding how frightened she was. Sam and I honeymooned in Hawaii and I did my best not to dwell on the struggles Dennis and Aubrey were facing alone. All things considered, it was a great trip and I was comforted by Sam's understanding and attention to my emotional needs in addition to her considerable skills in meeting my physical cravings. A few weeks later in mid-September, Sam and I flew to Dallas for a long weekend to visit Dennis and Aubrey. I walked in their door and their son and two daughters almost tackled me with hugs as they greeted their Uncle Luke. What really knocked the wind out of me was the sight of Dennis. The big, strapping center from my high school football team was thin and frail. His complexion was gray and he had the look of death looming over him. I struggled not to appear shocked and tried my best to treat my friend the same as I always did. After dinner, Sam helped Aubrey with the dishes and Dennis took me aside to his den. Luke, you probably figured I'm not gonna beat this. Come on, Dennis. You're a fighter. Life is a fight we all eventually lose, my friend. I'm okay with it. I'm more worried about Aubrey and the kids. They'll be okay financially, I took care of that, but promise me you'll look out for them, okay? I'm guessing they'll stay here in Dallas, but the kids will need contact with their godfather, Uncle Luke, and Aubrey will need her best friend. You didn't need to ask, but I promise. You know I love you, man. Don't ya? I know. The feelings are mutual. You're a good man, Luke, and a good friend. I couldn't stop my lips from trembling. I thought guys weren't supposed to cry. Dennis struggled to speak with an obviously tight throat. Real guys do, buddy. Can a silence be both warm and sad? That was how it felt for several moments until Dennis changed the subject. By the way, Sam seems awesome. I hope you guys have a long, happy life together. Two weeks later, Dennis was gone. The service and burial were in Washington where their families lived. Aubrey and the kids stayed with us for a few weeks as we tried to help them through the difficult process. Again, Sam was great and a true partner through a tough time. Several months passed before Sam approached me with an idea. You know Hugh, the owner down at the gym? He is looking to retire and asked if we might be interested in buying the place. Really? What you wanted to do? My career at Microsoft is nice, but this is more like my dream. It's something I'd love to do. Well, I really don't want to change careers. I'm too well established and have made a killing in the market. Why don't you do it yourself? Alone? I guess I could, but I don't have that kind of money. Maybe I can help. What's Hugh looking for? I have enough to pay what he wants for the business, but he also wants to sell me the building. That part of it is two million I don't have and don't think I could raise. I had been looking at setting up an LLC for the purpose of investing in real estate since my portfolio had grown considerably and therefore allowed me plenty of freedom to branch out into other investments. We moved forward with my LLC and named it Riley Investments. Sam set up a separate LLC in her name for the gym, after which Riley Investments set her up with a line of credit to make some improvements and cover her for fluctuating operating costs during the first several years of operations. Our accountant and lawyer drew up the agreements, and our new ventures launched smoothly. The night all the paperwork was filed I was smothered with kisses we celebrated energetically between the sheets for the whole weekend. 
Microsoft asked Sam to stay available as a consultant at a substantial hourly rate. We talked about the pros and cons, but we both knew that the extra income would really smooth out her finances. It didn't take long to see that the new business was going to be a grand success. Owning a business and doing work for Microsoft, which included making occasional trips, created a heavy load for Sam. She had the energy, but I had to chip in at the gym if she needed to be out of town. We were happy, though, and even started making plans for starting a family. Sam thought it could work if she eventually gave up the Microsoft work. Just after our first anniversary, Sam had to travel to Atlanta for three days to support some software development. As usual, we talked every night and shared the details of our days. On the second night of her trip, she called just after 3 p.m. West Coast time or 6 p.m. Atlanta time. Hey, Sam. How was your day? Awesome. We got a lot done but there's a lot more to do. I can't talk long since some of the team is getting ready to continue work over dinner. Can I make it up to you tomorrow? Sure. I'm heading over to the gym tonight to check on things so I may as well go see how the staff is holding up. Sounds good. Love ya, babe. Love you, too. I went to the gym and decided to get in a workout before taking time to check things out in the office. I was satisfied that things were going well and stayed to lock up at 9. I was tempted to call Sam, but it was after midnight in her time zone and I was sure she had put in a long day. I grabbed a shower and wanted to waste some time playing a game on my iPad. The Fitbit app caught my eye and I decided to see how my progress looked. I opened the app and I felt the blood drain from my body. My gut twisted up in pain as I saw the evidence of my life falling apart. Sam was exercising. Her Fitbit was active. At almost 1 a.m. her time, why would she be exercising? The more I looked, the more I recognized the pattern and I knew immediately what she was doing. I had to call her. On the first try her cell rang until it went to voicemail. She had a distinctive ringtone for me, so she had to know who was calling. I tried several times and it still kept going to voicemail. Finally, on the fifth try, Sam answered. Babe, is everything okay? No, it's not. Are you hurt or in the hospital or something? Hurt? Yes. I've been hurt badly. Oh, no. What happened? What's his name? What? Whose name? What are you talking about? The guy you're writing, cowgirl. What's his name? What are you saying? I'm not. Tell me, Sam. Why? Luke, I. How did? Are you here? Are you gonna answer my question? Oh, damn, how did you know? Next time you have love with someone other than your husband, take OFF your damn Fitbit. I disconnected the call, turned off my phone, and threw it across the room. Sleeping wasn't an option. I took a walk to try and cool down and, instead, walked miles crying my eyes out. This couldn't be happening. Not again. How do I keep ending up with wives that can't stay faithful? I walked back home with some planned tasks to accomplish. We kept our finances separate, but we had a few joint accounts and credit cards for household expenses. I went to the computer and emptied the accounts into one of mine and closed the ones I could online. I sent a late-night email to my law firm asking for a divorce attorney appointment as soon as possible. The next day I took off work to get my things in order. I had the divorce papers ready with the prenup in place. I met with my accountant and lawyer to start the process of calling in my loan to Sam for the gym, which was a clause in the loan documents that allowed me to demand full principal with 60 days notice. How could I be such an idiot? How did she fool me? Every fiber of my being ached and I wanted her to experience that pain and more. The vengeful fool in me wanted to ruin her. I hadn't talked to Sam since the incident, so I didn't know what her plans were about coming home. It didn't hell. P that throwing my phone destroyed the little sucker, and I had to buy a new one. I immediately blocked Sam's number. I needed a friend, so I called Aubrey. She calmed me down and begged me to be a little less vengeful. She was my conscience when I didn't want one, but I promised her I'd try. I thought of stopping at the pub, 
but if Sam kept to the original travel schedule she would be due back soon. I wanted to get the confrontation over with and hoped I'd arrive home before she did. I wasn't so lucky. I walked into Sam sobbing. She ran and tried to hug me, but I pushed her away. Don't touch me, Sam. Oh, please, oh God. I'm sorry. Please, please forgive me. Sorry. Not gonna happen. Don't leave me, please. I don't want to lose you. Lose? No. You threw us away. Luke, please, I was stupid. I thought. Thought? Thought what? That you could get away with it? Or maybe that I wouldn't mind? Or your brain told you that it wouldn't matter if you smashed our vows, or that you could deal with the consequences, or that you can disrespect me while sleeping around and it wouldn't make a difference? Or how about the thought that risking killing my love for you and tearing my heart out was worth taking? You didn't think. Or maybe you thought there was a guy with bigger equipment out there for you, or a better lover. Was that it? No, no. Then what stupid thought crossed your mind? Go on, give me your justification. It wasn't justified, all right. It was just stupid, recreational sex. Wrecker. You gotta be kidding me. How often do you have recreational sex, huh? Are you banging guys down at the gym? Taking on trains in the ladies' room? I can't comprehend how you could even come up with that as a reason. I just thought. There you go again trying to tell me you thought this through. If your libido was the problem, I was only a phone call away for a little phone sex. If you can't go two or three days without, then you're out of control. Please, Luke. Help us get past this. Let me sum it up for you, dear. You let another man, who you still haven't named, get intimate with you in a way that only belongs to you and me. Don't give me any crap that it's your body to do what you want with. It's yours and mine. Forsake all others, until death do we part. Remember that? Well, there was a death. Our marriage died as soon as he got you into bed. She wailed a deeper cry than I ever heard from a human. I wanted to enjoy her pain, but it was killing me too. Get yourself under control, shut up, and listen. You'll be served the divorce papers in the next several days. No, no. Please, not divorce. Help me make this. Listen, damn it. The prenup conditions related to cheating are in effect. You'll get very little out of this. I'm also calling in the loan. There's a principal balance of just over 350000 You'll have 60 days to pay it off or lose the gym to me. No, Luke. You'll ruin me. I said shut up and listen. I won't call in the loan if you sign the divorce. Fight it, then I go for everything. I don't care about the money or the gym. I just want you. Please let's work through this. No, Sam. You knew my painful history with cheating wives. You swore you wouldn't do that to me, and yet a year later you did just that. I'll never trust you again especially if you show so little respect for me when you knew what this would do to me. Damn it, Luke. I made a big mistake. I'm not perfect, but neither are you. Are you telling me you've never wanted to get with another woman? I fought my temper to stay calm. I bit my lips so hard that I could taste blood. Yeah, I'm not perfect. We all have fantasies. The difference is, you acted on it. I never would have. Please. Stop begging. It's making me sick. But we were planning a family. What? Can you really think I'd want my children to have a mother that thinks the way you obviously think? I want kind, respectable, moral, loving children that make this world a better place. I don't want their lives influenced by someone who could do what you did. She started wailing again, and I really didn't want to hear it. I left and told her I'd be back in a day or two after we both calmed down. It was hard leaving a destroyed woman that I loved bawling uncontrollably on the floor. At first I had hoped she felt as destroyed as I did, but I felt terrible guilt for how I left her. Plus, I had to get out of there before I broke down. 
I didn't want her to see that. After several days, I had cooled down. We did talk and I agreed to go to counseling to see if we could save things. I didn't want to be a three-time loser and I really did care for her. I just didn't know if I could ever regain that feeling that she was my life mate. After six weeks of meeting with a counselor, we drove home from our final session and Sam was uncharacteristically quiet. I glanced at her a few times and saw tears softly falling down her cheeks. Like a lot of guys, I'm not particularly observant, but I knew that night was going to change everything. We walked silently through the front door and Sam broke the silence. Can we sit and talk? I need to tell you a story. Sure, baby. I assume she chose to sit next to me on the couch to avoid making eye contact. Sam heaved a huge sigh and fought for composure as she started her tale. When I was a kid, my dad and I were really close. I was his princess, and he was my hero like a dad should be. My sister and I always snuggled with him on the couch when we watched a movie, or just relaxed as a family after dinner. Even through my teenage rebellion years, dad and I were close. When I was 16, I made a purity pledge to him at our church that I would save myself for marriage. I didn't make the pledge lightly. I meant every word. Our church had similar events when I was a kid. Yeah. It was a thing back then. Anyway, I started dating a guy from my Sunday school class. We had been dating about a year and he kept bugging me to get intimate. On my 18th birthday, I gave in and Pandora's box was opened. I couldn't get enough. I know how you are. Yeah. Anyway, everyone else in the family had to go out to a banquet one night and my boyfriend and I were home alone. Of course, we were naked before the family car left the driveway. About 15 minutes later, we were going at it and, yes, I was riding him hard. I looked up and saw my dad in the doorway staring at us. He was diabetic and had forgotten his insulin so he had to come back to get it. His mouth quivered as if he were going to say something, but instead he just walked away. I covered up enough to chase after him even though I had no idea what I was going to say. Just before going out the front door, he turned to me. He had tears in his eyes and I felt like I was hit by lightning. I couldn't move. Then he calmly said, you're a grown woman now and can make your own choices. Then he left. He took that rather calmly. No, not really. I hurt him horribly. The thing that broke my heart, though, was the look in his eyes that night and every day thereafter until he died. Before that, whenever he looked at me there was a look of love you couldn't miss. I would swear his eyes twinkled. But since that night, that look was gone. When he looked at me, I felt like all he could see was me writing my boyfriend a sight no father should have to see. Sam's face wore the tears and pain as she recalled her past. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized why she forced herself to tell me about this awful milestone from her past. I wanted to speak, but decided to let her finish. After that, we never snuggled again. Oh, sure, we hugged when we greeted or parted, but the closeness of daddy and princess was gone. We were loving, but we were father and daughter now. She paused to gather herself and I hugged her, partly to comfort her, but mostly to let her know I understood. Look. I see that same look my dad had when I look into your eyes now. Whenever you look at me, you see me riding some faceless guy and you relive my betrayal. I can sense that you desperately wanted to go away so we can go back to the way things were before I screwed up, but you can't help it. I'm sorry. I don't hold on to it to punish you or anything. I still love you. I know you do, but that look will always be there. You can't trust me no matter how much you want to. No matter what I do to make you believe I'll be faithful and will never stray again, in the back of your mind you'll always fear that old saying, once a cheater, always a cheater. There's nothing either of us can do. I broke what we can't fix to make things the way they were. What are you saying, that we give up? I'm saying that you deserve someone you can trust with your whole heart, and that I deserve to find someone that looks at me the way you used to before my stupidity. I'm saying we both need to move on separately. Back at the bar. Linda's emotions were on the edge. Tears were streaming down her cheeks in a silent cry. I had a few of my own from just reliving that nightmare. After I left Sam at the house, I came here to the pub. 
I walked in and Kaylee knew just by looking at me. Kaylee wiped away her own tears as she recounted that evening. I noticed Luke come in and I could see he was about to lose it. I yelled to Pete to watch the bar and whisk Luke into the office. The door barely closed when he collapsed into my arms and cried his eyes out. Linda locked her gaze onto her beer. I know that feeling. I know that pain. Kaylee soothed me and talked with me for several hours. She eventually got me to laugh a little and that's when she came up with my nickname. Three cheats to the wind? Yeah, Kaylee said. I told him he would survive this and eventually he could just toss this pain away and let the wind take it the way he did two times before. He swore he'd never put himself in that position again. I knew H. Him too well to believe he would live alone, but I figured he needed time. Linda placed her hand on mine with a slight smile on her face. But you look okay, now. In fact, you look more than okay. You give me hope. I just moved here to get a fresh start, and fate seemed to put us together, I think so you could share your story with me. You seem happy now. I finally realized that I was making the same mistake over and over again. It went back to high school when I decided that sex, image, and a sure thing were more important than shared values and respect. I'd had the perfect woman and let her slip through my fingers and never stopped looking for the wrong things. You were thinking of Aubrey. I closed my eyes and smiled. Oh, yeah. It took a few months before I was ready to move on from Sam, but I knew the woman I needed and wanted was the one who had always been my best friend. So you went to Dallas and swept her off her feet? Kaylee grinned and gently slapped the bar. You'd think he'd do something that simple, but no. Luke the genius managed to screw that up, too. Thanks, Mama Kaylee. Linda's face fell as if she were watching a tragedy unfold. You didn't go after Aubrey? Sure I did. But I was walking on eggshells with her because I didn't know if she was ready to move on herself from Dennis passing. We kept in touch and I was trying to sense when it would be the right time to confess my love. Kaylee, here, was my sounding board. I was ready to tell Kaylee that I had tickets to fly down to see Aubrey. Of course, I was planning to sweep her off her feet when I got there. So, what happened? Four weeks earlier. I woke up after a sleepless night. Actually, I guess you can't awake if you were never asleep, but I sat up with a new sense of purpose. I tossed and turned all night until, somewhere around 3 a.m., I made up my mind. I was going to Dallas to tell Aubrey how I felt. If things went as planned, I'd come home engaged to the woman I wanted for as long as I could remember. Once I reached that decision, I couldn't sleep because I had to fight my fears and embrace my excitement. I was a mess, but I was determined to find out if she felt the same way I did. It was Friday morning and I had to get some work done, so I went to the office and frantically did what absolutely had to be done, and managed to buy an airline ticket for the next day to get my butt to Dallas. It took longer to finish my tasks than I had hoped, but I managed to finish by 4 in the afternoon and I came to the pub to tell Kaylee my plans. 3. Cheat Luke, you're early today. I know, and I can't stay long, but I had to tell you that I finally decided to go see Aubrey. I've got to tell her. Well, you don't. Listen, I gotta run and get ready. I wanna go to the jewelry store so I make sure to show up with a ring in hand. Luke, listen. Kaylee, thanks for all your help. I couldn't. Luke, shut up and listen. I gotta deliver these drinks, but if you'll be quiet a moment and turn around, I think you'll find you don't need to go to Dallas. What? What do you mean? Look in the booth by the restrooms. I'll be right back. I turned around and my heart leapt in my chest, but just as quickly it fell into the abyss. I saw enough of her profile to recognize Aubrey, and she was sitting with some guy while holding his hand across the table. They smiled at each other like two people who shared a common love. The pain in the pit of my stomach was overwhelming. I quickly left the bar before I made a fool of myself and vomited in the bushes beside the front door of the bar. I was in shock. My brain was total mush and I couldn't put two simple thoughts together. I turned off my phone and drove around feeling sorry for myself. I just kept driving with my mind shooting off in tangents until the tears made it difficult for me to see. 
I realized I had driven all the way to West Seattle, so I drove down to Alki Beach to stop for a while. My eyes were burning when I finally found a parking spot. I pulled in and just sat there and cried like a baby. Finally getting control, I walked out to the sidewalk along the beach and just sat while the sun set over the water. Thoughts of all kinds flooded my head, but I still couldn't focus and I felt completely lost. It had to be around midnight when I was able to drive home. I took a shower, dressed, then drove to the office at about 1am hoping to fill my mind with something else. Besides being the middle of the night, it was Saturday and I knew I'd be alone during the day, and that was just what I wanted at that point. Other than cancelling my flight, I accomplished nothing. I caught a few hours of sleep on the couch in my office, then just sat in my desk chair looking out the window for answers that seemed beyond my grasp. Should I let her go? Should I fight for her? I couldn't make myself decide on what path was right and what was wrong. Finally, about 2 in the afternoon I went to the pub to see Kaylee. I realized I left the previous night without talking to her after she warned me about Aubrey being there with a date, so she was probably worried. I walked in and Kaylee immediately saw me, but the look on her face wasn't what I thought I'd see. I expected she'd be concerned about me, but she was clearly pissed. You damn fool. What the hell were you thinking running out of here like that? She plunked a beer in front of me, and without letting me get a word in, she decided to start ripping me a new butt hole. You jerk. You had me worried, you idiot. I gotta finish delivering some drinks, but you stay in that damn seat until I return. The words she actually used were changed to protect the innocent. Kaylee never cursed, much less at me, so I decided I better stay quiet. What was she so worked up about? She kept scowling at me and shaking her head while she muttered horrible names at me. She texted someone, then took care of the other customers, all the while giving me her evil looks. It took Kaylee about 10 minutes to finish what she needed to do when she finally stood in front of me glaring like a demon trying to pierce my soul. She obviously was trying to temper her mood before she spoke. I was frozen silent in fear. What a damn moron. I thought you were going over to Aubrey's table, but like a complete fool you ran out the door instead. What the hell came over you? What did that simple mind of yours think you were doing? I, I couldn't. Shut up. You spent months, no, years telling me how Aubrey was the woman you loved, and then you run out without talking to her? But, you warned me. You showed me where they were. Warned you? About what? Damn it, Kaylee. You know I love her more than life itself. I told you I was going to Dallas to finally tell her how I felt and ask her to marry me. In my mind I had already committed my life to Aubrey, the woman I loved with all that I had in me. I've loved her since we were kids and I would do anything to make her mine. When you warned me by showing me where she was sitting with her boyfriend, I realized Aubrey probably had other plans with that guy. Kaylee's face softened considerably, but then I noticed she wasn't looking at me, but just over my shoulder. Then I felt a tender hand on my back and heard the voice of an angel. Is that how you really feel about me, Luke? I've been waiting close to 20 years to hear you say those words. I spun around on the bar stool, and Aubrey pulled me to her. Our lips met in tongues danced with fury and passion like I've never experienced. I could feel our hearts and minds fuse into one love-bound life. Our spirits soared in a new dimension as if we could leave our bodies and look down on a heaven-blessed joining. After three marriages and a number of other relationships, it only took one real kiss to make me understand what dad tried to tell me all those years ago. It was confirmed without a doubt in my mind Aubrey was the one. She was the true love I've always wanted and needed. Back at the bar. Linda couldn't hide her tears falling. You almost missed out on the woman of your dreams again? Kaylee glared at me with a raised eyebrow. That, he did. Once he recovered enough from their rather erotic display of affection, I asked him what he was thinking to pull a stunt like that. I told you. She was sitting with another guy. Kaylee looked ready to scold me again, but I saw the twinkle in her eye. Then I told him he was a damn fool for making assumptions without checking them out. A smile spread across my face when I felt her hands on my shoulders before she spoke. Kaylee, are you being mean to Luke again? I turned to see my love and pulled her lips to mine. 
After a few seconds, Kaylee chuckled and cleared her throat. Ah, uh, you two want to get a room? This PDA is embarrassing all the customers. Aubrey smiled back at her. We'll make excellent use of a room in a few days, right, sweetie? Linda smiled with moist cheeks sparkling. You two are beautiful together. Oh, I'm sorry. Linda, I'd like you to meet my fiancé. Hi, Linda. Luke's manners are slightly out of whack. I'm Aubrey. Linda's eyes were streaming with happy tears. Aubrey, I'm so glad to meet you. Luke has been gushing about you all evening. I gotta tell you, if he ended up with anyone but you, this would have been the worst story I've ever heard. It's so great when high school sweethearts end up together. Luke, you have been talking about me? You're the only subject I find important enough to talk about. She gently kissed me again. Ah, you're so sweet. She raised her eyebrows and turned her attention to Linda. I wouldn't say we were sweethearts. We were best friends, for sure. I had to clarify. I think we both wanted to be sweethearts, but we struggled trying to find a way to transition from being close friends. Aubrey chucked and said, actually, Luke was a horny teenage boy and I was too serious to be the subject of his erotic ex. Paramentation. Okay, she's right. I sometimes wonder how things would have been if I had matured a lot earlier. I always loved her and settled for three women who had her outward beauty, but were hollow inside and could never match the person she was and still is. Well, Aubrey, Luke was certainly accurate when he beamed about how lovely you are. Oh, you two are too kind. All that matters is when I look into his eyes I can see how his heart is so intertwined with mine. I know he loves me unconditionally and I feel like the luckiest woman on earth. Linda grabbed Aubrey's hand and scanned us both with a worried look. Wait. What happened to the other boyfriend? Aubrey looked at her with an understanding smile. There was no other boyfriend. That was my cousin, Paul. I was staying with him and his wife for a few weeks while I looked for a home in the area. I had already planned to move back and hoped Luke, here, would finally grow a set and ask me to marry him. Linda grinned and wiped a few tears from her eyes. You two are beautiful together. Damn, I was hoping I'd have a shot at Luke, she laughed, but I can see that's a lost cause. I moved here from California for a new start and hope to find some new friends and, maybe, a true soulmate. I hope there's a few more out there like Luke that are my age. Kaylee reached across the bar and grabbed my shoulder and Linda's with her other hand. Linda, you have three new friends right here. Aubrey chimed in. Yes, in fact, you must come to the wedding on Saturday especially since you're new around here. Oh, that's sweet, but I can't intrude. Shoot, girl. Coming to celebrate the marriage between two of your three friends in the Seattle area is no intrusion. We'll be offended if you didn't. Besides, almost everyone there will be from this area and I'm sure you'll come away with dozens of new friends. Okay, you talked me into it. Luke, honey, text her the details. You two really are the sweetest couple. Does it seem a shame you both had to go through such tough times to get here? I can't totally speak for Luke, but I think he needed the experiences he had to get his head on straight. As for me, I wouldn't trade anything for my time with Dennis or with the joy our three kids have given me. I loved that man with everything I had. So wishing we started differently with Luke doesn't matter, and in the end may not have worked at all. I think the timing was just right, and the good Lord knows what he's doing. My love for Luke never left me, and it's just as strong as the love I had for Dennis. I'm just fortunate to have two great men who have filled my life with love. That's so sweet. It's a real miracle that you finally get to be together. It wasn't a miracle, it was a conspiracy, I said as Aubrey smacked me upside the head and laughed. Kaylee and Aubrey worked it all out behind my back. That's sorta true, Kaylee added. When Luke and Sam broke up, I called Aubrey. Luke had already told her, but I said that wasn't why I was calling. I asked her when the two of them would wake up and get together. Aubrey snickered as she took over the story. Dennis had been gone for 11 months at that point, and I wasn't quite ready to launch into a new relationship. I have to admit that getting with Luke was not a new concept to me. 
But I wasn't ready and I didn't think Luke would be ready either with his latest breakup being so fresh. Luke and I still talked at least once a week and I could hear the anger and hurt in his voice. So I told Kaylee to work on the healing process since I knew Luke was in here almost every night, and I would try to gauge his progress when Luke called. I already knew I wanted Luke, and I figured he'd be ready just about the time I was healed enough to move forward. I jumped in when Aubrey paused. It took about six months, and I found that I couldn't think of anything or anyone but Aubrey. I even contemplated leaving my job and moving to Dallas to start my own business with the hopes that Aubrey and I could make a future. Of course, he didn't know I was already planning to move back home to Kirkland. Shush, sweetie. I'm telling this. Go on, hotshot. So, anyway, they had planned when Aubrey was going to show up in the bar to spring herself on me. And then the fool nearly ruined everything with his disappearing act. Kaylee. You ladies can't let a guy tell his story. Sorry. Go ahead. As I was saying, that's when I almost ruined everything. You know the rest. When Aubrey came up behind me after Kaylee reamed me out, it was as if I went from total darkness to glorious light. When Aubrey spoke, before I could blurt out a word or even finish spinning my seat around, I was getting the deepest, most passionate kiss of my life. I felt it, like a bolt of electricity jump started my heart to beat for the first time. That was some kiss, baby. Every kiss with you is like that. Anyway, we finally separated our lips, she looked into my eyes, and asked, you tell her, sweetie. I said, Luke, do you love me as much as I just heard you tell Kaylee? He was talking so sweet about me. And I answered, I love you with all that I am, and I want us to be a family. Marry me, Aubrey. That was four weeks ago. Wait. The two of you planned a whole wedding in four weeks? Linda, I've wasted 16 years getting the woman I've always wanted. I knew she was the right one for me all along, and I blew it by making too many stupid choices. We weren't gonna waste a second more than we had to. The wedding was glorious. No one will ever convince me that there is a more beautiful woman than Aubrey. Linda did come to the wedding. She spent a lot of time getting to know lots of people, but she paid particular attention to Aubrey's older brother, who happened to be single. They've been a hot item for several months now, and Linda has become one of our closest friends. I'm no longer Uncle Luke, but the kids now call me Papa Luke. They asked if they should call me Dad. I told them that I already loved them as if they were my own, but their dad was a special man and that they should always remember him as Dad. Papa, or what became Papa Luke would work just fine. Before the wedding, Aubrey asked if I wanted any kind of prenuptial agreement. No way, honey. You are my life and everything in the world to me. Trust me, there is no need for plan B as far as I'm concerned. So, three cheats to the wind isn't going for the record? No way. Being married to you is a joy that is so far beyond what I deserve. My days of marrying cheaters are in the past. Perhaps one of our kids will write a story about us someday. Maybe they'll call it. It only took four tries, or something clever like that. Speaking of kids, Mr. Riley, we need to fix up a nursery. My three cheaters from the past have most definitely been thrown to the wind and no longer rule over me. I can now say with every fiber of my being, oh, yeah. Life is good.